Hello there, Atlanta. First of all, let me give you my personal congratulations, but I'm calling here. We're running an election morning blog at the Star, uh, hosted by Dave Dale. Hi, Atlanta. Congratulations. Hi, Oh, thank you. Right on. You. Thanks for all your support. Well, you're welcome. You deserve it. Oh, my gosh. What an adventure. How does it feel? Kind of surreal a little bit still. Even after going to City Hall last night and doing all that, I just still feel like, oh my God, <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> Winner's remorse, eh? Hey? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm sure there might be a little bit of that at one time or another, but hey, no, I think it'll be uh, awesome. And I tried texting Peter Churko at 5 o'clock this morning and saying, and I, I, well, I did text him. I said, when's our first meeting? I haven't gotten an answer yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the mayor's last uh, day, of, official day, is November the 14th. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, but, no, so that, when no, do but, we but, start? Well, you, well you'll, you'll get sworn in probably on the uh, 15th. I, I think the 14th is a Thursday. Probably they'll swear you in on the, uh, on the Friday, but there'll be meetings before that. The new council will, will meet. Yeah, we have an orientation or something, don't we? Oh, yeah, I mean, uh, and the other thing about it is, I mean, you know Karen, and Karen's very good, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, she can, uh, she can help you along uh, with, uh, with stuff. I mean, uh, as, far as, that, as far as that goes, and, uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, the big thing's going to be choosing how the committee structure's going to work, because, of course, Peter wanted to be able to choose his own, but, uh, and you see when he's got three rookies up front who should get the three committees, uh, he might try to, uh, uh, you know, bully some people out of that, those positions, but, well, you're who there. Might, who might try to do that? Jericho. Oh, he can kiss my fat <laughs> Okay, that'll be my first blue. Oh, I forgot Dave Dale was there. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> That'll be my first uh, bleep out of, of the audio. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, it's uh, interesting. I was talking to uh, one of the other candidates that uh, uh, didn't get in, but I talked to him beforehand, and they were talking about the picking of the chairs and whatnot, and uh, uh, he was kind of thinking it was not a bad idea for the mayor to be able to pick his uh, upfront team. I said, are you kidding me? Uh, that's not I said, are you kidding me? If, if, if you get a woman elected into the chairmanship, you're, you're going to try to get her out of there? Good luck. <laughs> yeah, good luck on that. Yeah, I, I dare him. I double dare him to try to pull that stunt. No, no, you... Not just me, let me tell you. I, I, I'm sure he... There's females there that'll eat him alive. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I think the, the, uh, the small gap between him and Joanne, it, like, he didn't get a really strong mandate, so I, he'll probably come in and be... Uh, it would be more Team North Bay than Team Jericho, right? That's what I'm trying okay. to say. Yeah. yeah, it's got, oh yeah, you're right. And you're, and you're a big part of Team North Bay. So are you at Georgia Store now? Yes, we are. Yeah. Oh, okay, well we'll pop over there for a few minutes. I'm just out picking up signs because I wasn't sure if I wanted to see people today or <laughs> not. Oh, great. Yeah, come on over. Okay, I'll see you in a few. Okay, bye. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, bye. You see, the council is not a management board. So, it, 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 or it, it, you know, it's not there to direct people. Councillors can't go out and say, I don't like how you plow in the street, go back and replow it. Or do it. That's what you have staff for. You're there, essentially, to set policy and control finances. Yeah. And that's what it's all about. So what you need are people who are smart with the dollar. Now, one thing I can say about Lana is, she, actually, she would make a great budget chief because she's very conscious about money. What she understands about money and contracts, you can't believe. Because I know watching her over the years, you know, like with the contracts she gets with the DSABs and the rest of it, she reads every inch and she goes in and checks this and she's always going back to them saying, hey, this doesn't make any sense. What does this mean? And they look at it because a lot of it's boilerplate and they say, uh, we'll, we'll get back to you because they don't know they they they've, they've put this contract together, but nobody reads it as conscientiously as she does. Actually, I'll tell you, she would have been a hell of a lawyer. She would have been really good. Well, she's for a details. sharp lady, man. She's very smart. Yeah, you know, very very smart. And uh, the other thing is, 
she knows uh, what goes on in uh, every little corner of the city. You know, she knows who's who and who does what and who shouldn't be doing what or whatever. Like she has a lot of. I see that Gary made it too, eh? Oh yeah, I figured Gary would go. Actually, Gary had a very Gary? interesting campaign, a virtual campaign, right? So you know, you got to take your hat off to him. I wasn't sure how that was going to work out. In fact, he was here. Uh, what, last week? Last week. Yeah, he was in last week chatting with us, and I said to him, I, I saw one of your signs oh, uh, on Facebook. Oh, yeah, but he said, that's a virtual sign. It doesn't count. <laughs> so I'm sitting here with George Marousis. I'm doing a little uh, podcast uh, talking about the election. Do you want to be uh, uh, audio part of it, and so you can say a few things? Sure. Okay, uh, I'm going to put you on speakerphone, and we got Mark, Mark King on the phone. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's just getting set up. Okay, hold on a sec. All right. Hi. Okay, Mark. Congratulations for getting uh, reelected. <laughs> it's going to be quite the council. Oh yeah, yeah. What are what are your thoughts and observations about uh, what transpired transpired last night? Well, I'll tell you, I, uh, I actually uh, woke up at about 6 o'clock this morning in a cold sweat, uh, actually thinking about about the ramifications of what's gone on and, uh, you know, the, uh, the overall makeup of the uh, council. It's quite, uh, it's quite interesting to see uh, three brand new people it's uh, pretty very, very important uh, committees of council. So uh, I would say I would say the mayor really, uh, really is going to have a tough time figuring out first of all who is uh, who is going to take a budget chief. Yeah. So how does the process work in your mind? You've been on council quite a few times. Uh, um, now. The top person, Maggie Horsfield, would get first choice on that matter? Well, <laughs> yes, that, uh, that's exactly how the procedural bylaw works. Uh, it's been done that way uh, as long as I can remember. Uh, she, she would have the option to take uh, budget chief. Uh, and I did talk to her last night, actually, at City Hall. I asked her whether she knew what the operating budget was of the... Uh, of the city of North Bay, it's probably probably sitting at about uh, 105 million. Uh, and that's just operating, not capital. But um, she wasn't actually up to speed on the budget process. So, um, where do you go to if, in fact, you don't have that individual uh, in place with the experience to handle it? So you start to go down the line of people that are available or that have the experience uh, to to take on what I think is probably going to be one of the most difficult budgets we've seen in the city. So I'm not sure how that works, Dave, uh, but uh, the mayor has a heck of a job uh, trying to bring, uh, you know, the council together so that uh, somehow it works. Yeah, well, you know, I'm not as fearful as you as uh, having a new person in those positions because I, although we've had some interesting examples with uh, Sheldon in 2014 and and uh, Tanya after that right and and they grew into the jobs I think <laughs> yeah I was talking, you know, and, and I was talking to the CFO about that last night and uh, you know I mean her response to me was uh, there's a very large learning curve uh, that has to take place, but you have to remember, in Sheldon's case, for example, uh, Derek, uh, Derek, Derek, uh, 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 well, you know, in the, in the case of, uh, of uh, Sheldon, I mean, quite frankly, what was going on in the background was that Derek Shulbert was there in support of Sheldon. He was the, he was the deputy chair. He was the guy that was, uh, you know, liaisoning with senior staff in the finance department to try and put something together that looked like a budget. 
Right. I mean, we all, and I, you know, Sheldon came into my office the day after the election, and I told him, you know, it, 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 you know, turn that responsibility over to somebody that has an understanding of what's involved. Uh, but he, he decided to go down that route, and and what ultimately happens when you have a very very difficult budget like that, you end up getting saddled with the story, and and that happened with uh, Tanya, quite frankly, and oh, yeah, she had her dad support. Uh, you know, through that uh, through that budget That's process, right. because he was, uh, you know, vice chair. So, how does that work? I'm not quite sure how it works. Hold on a sec. Wait a sec. No, it's not live. Oh, okay. It's not live. It's the uh, Flan was just asking me if this is live. No, I'm going to edit out uh, the the uh, certain things and uh, run it tomorrow. Yeah, which is so bad right. words. Yeah. <laughs> Well, no, those are good points there, Mark, but, um, you know, if you're budget chief and you work with the mentor deputy chair, um, you know, that might help get things moving, yeah. right? Like, it all depends on your committee, right? And if you work with your committee. Yeah, and so the question is, uh, who's the deputy in that situation? Because ultimately, you know, you wear these things and uh, they can be... You know, we're probably looking at three or four months of really hard uh, budget process that um, that will really uh, draw the personalities out, and uh, you know, it'll it'll just depend on on um, on how they think. You know, I made and I made it perfectly clear. That, you know, zero percent increase was one of my one of my top processes, and you know, I'll remain at that point. Uh, through through the budget process. Oh, that's cool. Well, Lana wants to say something to you. <laughs> <laughs> surprise! 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 Okay. Okay, Mark. So, and maybe I'm just being a little bit defensive, but I prefer open and honest communication. Are you okay with that? Well, um, absolutely, and I think if you, you know, you remember the uh, discussion at the Elks Club, uh, you know, one of the first things that we have to ascertain, and of course the mayor, uh, mayor-elect agreed that we would bring, uh, we would bring uh, Mr. Vallon or, or Judge Vallon in to talk about uh, transparency inside uh, council communication, and uh, boy, I'll tell you, uh, not only bringing uh, Judge Allen back in, but the reinstatement of uh, the five-minute process where where people can actually come to council and talk about their concerns uh, is paramount in, in the whole system. And I think that was probably one of the biggest issues uh, that was floated up there. So I. I Open, transparent, absolutely, uh, tremendously supportive of that. Uh, tried to make, uh, you know, tried to get George, Judge Vallon uh, in uh, during the last council through a motion. It, it, it never got off the ground. Okay. Okay. Now, let's give Lana a turn. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's my turn now. Thank you. Um, so I was just reading the uh, one article, Mark. Oh, well, let me finish with the five minute. Uh, presentation first and I said it at the Elks Club as well too that uh, we can bring that back and I think that's fantastic I agree with it but at the yeah. same time we need to respect people when they're making presentations and pay attention and stay engaged because um, having made numerous presentations both going on in on my own and also as going in being invited by the people I was pres presenting to it's not a welcoming um, environment and that needs to change so and and I know you know that's true well um, you know absolutely I mean I you know over the years I felt the pressure of council but uh, you know because of my, I felt that internal uh, pushback that was going on uh, internally it is extremely difficult for an individual to come to council and make a presentation. We all know that. Okay, and the community boards as well, too. There are no well, better to make presentations to. Yeah, no, and I, you know what, Lana, I know where you're going with that. And uh, I uh, have been fully supportive 
you know, as chair of DSAP to let anyone come in. As a matter of fact, uh, if you want to remember back probably about two and a half years ago, we, we actually had a, a person that was virtually homeless uh, come in and uh, speak to the board about uh, their personal feelings and trying to give the board uh, the understanding of what's going on in our community. Absolutely very, very supportive of that. Okay, well that's good. And then um, the one other thing I, I guess I find and um, a little bit of a, a kind of like a challenge is that you made um, some comments about uh, uh, three women in the three top positions and I hope um, they understand what they're in for because those are heavy hitting committees and stuff like that. Like at one time you were new too, did like people take shots at you too? Well, you know, to be honest with you, Alana, when I first got on council, and I can tell you I probably spent pretty close to three years of uh, uh, actually at council meetings before I ever sat there. And, uh, you know, being uh, president of the Chamber of Commerce, I had a continual dialogue uh, with elected uh, officials at the council table. And not only that, probably 30 or, well, it was about 32 years, and George can correct me there, but, you know, watching my dad go through the council process and understanding uh, how it actually works. One of the things that's, that, that is, is somewhat disappointing for me, and I'll be, I'll be quite honest with you, um, uh, the experience and building up the experience uh, to actually understand how challenging these positions are uh, is is paramount when you run for council. And and I I, I have trouble, uh, you know, trying to understand um, how uh, people without the experience. Uh, just taking over uh, three of those top positions is extremely difficult. If I asked you, Lana, you know, as uh, number two in that position, what your experience is Not with me. public works, and, uh, you know, through that uh, through that process, that's really, you know, that could be your uh, your position. So, how much experience you have with public works, whether you understand uh, the different departments and how it works, uh, it is a tremendous learning uh, experience for brand new people. So, I, you know, I, I, people can learn. There's no question. There's going to be a, probably a, a six to eight month curve uh, for many to even understand how the whole process of council works. You know, when you go into a council meeting, you better understand every one of those motions and read every one of those reports coming from staff so that you're able to make a, a decision based on hard work. And that's the way I've worked over the years. Now, whether or not new people understand how, how challenging that can be in, you know, your everyday life is, uh, is really, it'll be interesting to watch. But, I, I, and I... You know, I make this promise, Lana, you know, because the public are probably listening or will listen to this, is that I'm there to help. I'm not there to hinder. And uh, I'll help the new people any way I can, if in fact they ask for help. But, um, you know, that's that's the way I look at it. We're all elected there to try and make a better city. Um. I guess definitely get your uh, your point on the experience and having some some knowledge going in, uh, Mark. Because I remember seeing you on the planning advisory board covering those when we uh, when you used to be with that. And I think it's definitely an asset going in. But I kind of see well, the, 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 I can see why and how the democracy sort of leads towards uh, sometimes change like this. But I only see those chairs as actually chairs of committees, and it's definitely if you have. I know Lana has uh, experience chairing a committee, um, and it's just a matter of working with your committee and drawing those other experiences and uh, assets out of the people on it. So I, I'm not that fearful of uh, of new new candidates uh, getting those top spots as long as they can run a committee. And I think Maggie's had some experience as well, 
up at the university enough to sort of probably get started and uh, she'll learn on the job as long as she has a strong committee and guys you know and pe members of the committee who have some experience to help and uh, so that's good that you're willing to help and I think yeah, like uh, I've always been that way uh, Dave I mean I, re I recognize the uh, the process and I recognize you know how difficult it is you know and I look at my daughter for example uh, Maggie's two years older than my daughter and um, I, I guess the the part that that is is difficult to try and understand. They don't. Um, and I'm talking about my daughter right now. They don't have the life experiences that uh, somebody that's been around the the horn a number of times, like George, for example. And George, in fact, like I would rely on George many, many times with respect to. <clears throat> to, with respect to DSAP and to a number of issues that were going on uh, inside city council because his judgment was really, really good because he'd been there for so long and he understood the undercurrents that were going on. And we talked, you know, through the election about, and you could hear it in the public, that, that they were overly concerned that staff were running council and that's a tricky tricky game to play because new people will have to rely an awful lot on staff as they start to move through this particular transition so the question will be whether or not they they have the overall understanding to make decisions on their own without uh, without being uh, shaded uh, by the direction of staff. And, and the perfect example will be whoever sits on community services as the chair will have an opportunity to push forward the new arena. So how will they push that forward? And will they be seduced by staff, some staff, that want a particular design that's already out there in the public is is a really interesting process. And um, you know as well as I do, uh, you know, uh, chairs move motions and they get a seconder on the motion. It's generally the vice chair of that uh, committee. But have they actually got enough experience and understanding to be able to to really understand what's going on behind the scenes. Very, very tricky to do, and you can get yourself in an awful lot of trouble with the public if you're not careful. <laughs> but isn't it just like running any, any other business or any other board committee or doing any other type of project in the community? You need to know your budget, you need to speak with the community, you need to speak with the people that will be using whatever project you're creating or developing and then coming in on budget, sticking to it, and uh, how are you going to fund it and make it happen? Like, I, I think there's enough of us, even though we're new to council seats, that have worked with council for years, and DSABs, and police um, um, boards, and the different associations that are involved, that uh, I would think we're not all totally green to this situation, and I think we ran based on certain beliefs of gaps or needs or things that need to be more emphasized in the community and I'm not saying I don't think everything needs to change I think there's amazing things about North Bay that we need to protect and try to keep in play um, I think experience is important but I think cost uh, lifelong learning and being open to, to new stuff all the time is important as well too hmm. I, no, I, I can't not agree with that Lana and uh you know the devil's in the details when it uh, when it gets right down to those uh, those types of situations. You know. Oh, a hundred percent. And you know what, Mark? I think too. It's just like new council members, old council members, council as a whole. Um, some of us are going to do a good job of doing our homework and coming prepared to meetings, and it'll quickly become evident who doesn't, right? Yeah. So I, you know, it was kind of interesting and behind the scenes, and I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't want to go down this road in any way, shape, or form. I've done it once already with the prior uh, council looking at OPP pricing, for example. 
And there were, I'll be honest with you, there were pressures in the community prior to the actual election asking me for, for statements about that. And I, I stayed uh, totally away from it because I, quite frankly, I didn't want to want to deal with it before the election. It, those are the types of questions that are really, really hard to answer at, as counselors and your overall belief about trying to stay within budget and understanding the the undercurrents that are going on inside the economy right now because they're not good. You know it, Lana. I know it. Oh, 100% I know it. But, yeah. like, even, Mark, like, I would love to promise a, a 0% tax increase. I'd like to promise a reduction. That would be the ultimate as a counselor to pull that off, right? I just look at it, like, from gas for vehicles to... Um, you know, like wages and salaries to union negotiations to even the hydro, cost of hydro and, and heating going up. Like, if we say zero, aren't we saying we're okay with cutting stuff? Like, can we pull that? I don't know. I know we have to do a budget review. I know we're going to have to look at everything. Um, but, like, I can't imagine that previous councils have left that much slippage in those budgets for us to be able to pull that without having to, to cut different things. Well realistically uh, you know mark I'm not sure if you'd agree zero is not realistic uh, four percent might be realistic what do you think so I would ask you four percent high yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean the, the question back to that uh, you know your question is um, why four percent so the and the question is um, if you remain at status quo, and we had 6% the last budget, right? 6% increase, of, that was Tanya's last budget. So, and we, and we have these other mitigating circumstances. We, we have Castle Home that's going to, will be completed, and we'll have a lot of, I, depending on where the interest rates go, in excess of $3 million hit to the, uh, to, to the budget of the city. So, when we, when we look at uh, drivers like that, or we look at, $55 million cost with respect to the new arena, how do we justify those types of increases and the delivery of service when you know full well people right now, some people are watching and trying to renew mortgages on their houses and recognizing that those mortgage costs have, have doubled. Doubled, and that's mm -hmm. that's what I'm hearing out there in the public. So I agree. My four percent isn't a, isn't realistic. <laughs> well, it more isn't, Dave, and, but we've got all these drivers going on. And well, th this is what's so difficult about about the situation. It's tremendously difficult. Yeah. I think I think it's definitely going to be challenging, Mark. Like we're going to have to sit down and take the biggies and the smaller amounts, and we're going to have to come to agreements on uh, all the different pieces of the beast, right? Because uh, we've got some huge challenges um, financially coming at us, and we have some huge challenges that are going to end up costing us some money, even if we facilitate getting the funds to do what we have to do for people supporting in our community from other sources. Just on that point, and, and I've been trying to stay away from this, we, we, we have a tremendous bill going on at the Low Barrier Shelter. And yeah. it, it could be in excess of $3 million. Uh, DSAP has the option to levy the municipalities. We've been absolutely staying away from that because we didn't, it makes no sense to do that because you're impacting those taxpayers that are really in a bind trying to figure out how to pay bills. So how do you do that? So, you know, the, the, and, and I would hope that, you know, members of Kempton really takes the time to, to think about how you actually go back to senior levels of government, both at the provincial and the federal level, to understand the difficulties. And that's why that last report from these uh, came out that indicated, you know, the the uh, net family income in this region is 25.5% less than the provincial average. And that's why 
we've got the problems we have. Well, that's part. That's a big part of it, but that's not all yeah. of it. We have policies that were made, decisions that were made years ago. Um, we shut down psychiatric facilities. We didn't follow through with the proper care and support. And there's been a systemic neglect going on out in the communities um, for a yeah. long time. You know that as well as I do, Mark. You deal with it every day too. Um, and we need to start holding the right places accountable. Um, we're still spending huge money on mental health and addiction supports in the community and look at what, what's happening to people um, trying to deal with those challenges. Like, yeah. we need to maybe re be redirecting. It doesn't always have to be new money, it needs to be a better spend of the existing funds because we are siphoning cash by the millions in that area. And look where we're at. It's horrible. People are overdosing every day, multiple times. People are overdosing and dying. Like, this is a sick situation that's got to get fixed. I think you guys are in agreement on that, really, from different sides. Uh, it's definitely a bigger problem, uh, but there's some... Lana is saying you, you, there's some uh, decisions that can be made better with the money that exists as well, just redirecting it. Mark, do you see any places where uh, um, money can be spent better? She and Lynn Bennett were the first women in my entire life that ever told me to f off. <laughs> I've never, never, I've never had, you know, I grew up with all my sisters and their friends and all the rest of it, and I never, ever had a woman tell me to f off. But I'll tell you, those two were the first two. Well, and they, and it was, and it was, and it wasn't like it just happened once. It was like. All the time. Anytime you stepped over the line? Yeah, or, or teased them a little bit. Right, okay. You know, because what happens after a while, you you poke them a bit, you know, yeah. because after all, if you can get a rise out of them. Yeah. You know, and it, it was like, I remember uh, the first time I thought, girls don't talk like this. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not, you know, this, this isn't the way, uh, you know, I was brought up with girls telling you to f off. I mean, never had a girl in high school tell me to f off. Not, not, not even when I was at university. Worked for Bell Telephone in Toronto. Of course, your customers aren't going to tell you to fuck off. But, you know, when I was repairing phones and installing mm -hmm. phones for Bell Telephone in Toronto in the 60s. And, you know, and then, of course, I went to Teachers College. And, and you know, like, and of course, the, the other thing is, like, in our home, my dad might cuss away a little bit in Greek under his breath or whatever, but he wasn't, never used bad language. And of course my mum, well, you know, she would never say anything like that. Eh? So I was brought up, you know, where, you know, I mean, uh, my friends and I, we obviously used the word, especially when we're playing hockey and stuff, but yeah, those were the first two women that ever told me to f off. That's wild. Well, that's a good lead into uh, the, the uh, historic election with North Bay Council now having five women on there. And uh, Peter Chirico will have to learn how to manage that. It's a little different. Yeah, well, it's, uh, you know, obviously it's you know, always about managing uh, uh, people. But I mean, I think the, uh, the thing is that you have to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, uh, to be a a good leader, and that's what the mayor has to be. The mayor's role is to uh, is to lead, uh, because after all, he's only got one vote, and generally that only happens if it's a recorded vote or a tie vote. So it's not like that he has some kind of a veto power or anything like that. You know, so uh, you know he has to be able to uh, be a leader and uh, uh, have people who. Uh, you know, will support good ideas. Yeah, and I don't really see that happening with this council, even though it's five men and five women. I don't, I don't really see it being genderized so and split like that because there's so many different political perspectives at the table. Like this is a very interesting, eclectic council. Yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, it sure is. It's going to be interesting to see how it develops. Yeah, and you know, I don't see that you have. Uh, any real dominant uh, counselor either. <coughs> you know, like in the past, historically, you would have people like Dick Donnelly, mm -hmm. who actually, uh, you know, especially when Merle Dickerson was in uh, in power, 
who actually ran the council. And, uh, uh, you know, you don't have uh, uh, that type, those types of personalities uh, on the council. I guess the, the closest to a strong personality is probably Mark King. You know, I, I would, and of course, you know, his dad was certainly a lot stronger a personality than Mark is. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't see a strong personality being necessarily a benefit with this group of councillors. Well, no, I, I think, uh, in fact, it may very well uh, create a problem mm -hmm. uh, rather than uh, being, uh, being a benefit. And of course, it would be very frustrating to the person who thought they could run things by being a little louder or a, a little more of a, of a bully. I don't think age is going to be helpful either because uh, you don't really see the perspective of some of the young councillors. It's, it's, uh, if you don't understand that, like when Mark was trying to fathom how such novice people could be elected in this day and age, when it used to take steps of, uh, of uh, you know, he was on the planning advisory, he was president of chamber, and he, he went to council meetings for three years, and uh, they're all great prep, but... Uh, um, we did talk a lot with Lana about how uh, you don't really need to have that much direct experience for those committees. You just need to know how to run a committee. Yeah, I mean, and uh, that's a skill that's fairly uh, straightforward. I mean, I think it has a lot to do with your personality. Mm -hmm. Like if you're uh, diplomatic and you understand what the role of a chair is, uh, and you're not trying to, uh, you know, uh, bully people or push people in a particular direction or another. Uh, because basically, if you're the chair of the committee, you're a little bit like the mayor. You only have one vote, and you have to have your committee on side. Uh, and very often, this is where the public uh, is present, uh, because you know that at committee, this is where uh, there are uh, certain consultants, experts that come in and make presentations and then especially in community services where if it's a planning or zoning matter where the general public can come and make a presentation and then of course developers have their professional people come in and make uh, presentations. So you have to you know know how to uh, to handle that uh, in a professional, courteous fashion and allow people to be heard. And at the same time, sometimes you have to be able to keep your committee on topic because, you know, people sometimes will use a little more latitude, especially, uh, you know, I mean, and that, that once again is a mayor's job is to keep things on, on topic and not let people go off the uh, the deep end and there's a fine line there about cutting people on or uh, or off mm -hmm. you know and uh, that's a human skill uh, and I think you know it's something that can be developed and learned and it has an awful lot to do with people's personality well we both know Lana can run a committee just like anybody else and um, Maggie comes out of uh, the university and involved with the board. Uh, she's, you know, got that type of level. She's polished. She'll figure it out. And uh, Justine, actually, uh, when I was interviewing her, she said that she ran a, uh, a not-for-profit charity for a while as well, right? So those are skills that can be applied to uh, just doing committee work. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's, uh, you know, to some degree, it's like if you're sitting around with a group of your friends having a discussion about something. Yeah, if everything's, uh, everybody's heading in the right direction and they, they actually yeah. want to get something done. Yeah. Now, the staff input to committees is pretty important. I know there's people that think that city staff run things, but what's your uh, opinion? Well, of course, I, the, uh, I mean, obviously, I mean, city staff, they are the experts. And, uh, you know, we hire them for their qualifications and their expertise in certain areas. Uh, and we rely on them to give us uh, uh, factual information that, uh, that really is in line with what our policies are 
or what in, in many cases what the policies of the provincial or federal government may be depending on the subject mm -hmm. uh, and to also help us understand certain technical issues uh, that we may not have expertise in uh, so that uh, you know there's a, a bit of uh, of that and uh, I mean quite frankly uh, as we've said on many occasions uh, being a councillor and even the mayor is not supposed to, supposed to be a full-time job uh, and you know your job is to uh, you know uh, make policy make sure policy is followed and also establish budgets and parameters because you just don't want to be handing out blank checks because we're talking about the taxpayers money and we want it to be well spent and uh, you know the uh, on occasion you need to review how the uh, city operates and there's nothing wrong with that uh, and uh, you know to some degree when you have uh, quite a number of new councillors it might even be a good idea for the uh, the mayor and the committee chairs to determine that uh, at every council meeting there'll be five or ten minutes set aside so that someone from the different departments that can schedule them can come and talk about what it is they do and what what they have to adhere to whether it's the Ontario Building Code or this that or the other thing uh, to help educate uh, and maybe in some cases re-educate some of the older guys <laughs> as to, you know, what the rules are. Because, yeah. uh, you know, the other thing that a lot of times people don't understand is that a municipality uh, basically operates uh, at the discretion of the province. We don't have any particular uh, powers or status like we can't sue the province they they're, they're like mother uh, they come down with a rule and they say thou shalt do this the same way as the federal government can in some areas but not as many as as what the province can and we don't have any choice and of course we're always uh, soliciting money from them so you know and money always comes with strings attached and so you have to be able to have the expertise to see where the strings are attached and in some cases if you don't like the strings that are attached you might say no we're not accepting that grant because it's going to end up costing us more money or it's going to have us do something that isn't a priority uh, because we still have to put some of our money into it and you know th th that always happens that way but I mean uh, municipalities like municipal government is pro is the government that's closest to the people and that's why it's so disappointing when you don't have a high turnout uh, the federal government's the furthest from the people and they always get the highest turnout yeah uh, and uh, the municipal government has more effect on the day-to-day -day lives of the people who live in the community than any other form of government really because it's so close they you know, they plow the streets and pick up the garbage, deliver the water. I mean, it's the real basics. And then after that comes the province that delivers education and health. Mm -hmm. But really, municipality is right, right there, you know? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think, judging by the votes, I didn't get the specific number, but uh, less than 40% anyways, eh? Disappointing, isn't it? Yeah, Especially even when, when you had online voting. Yeah, and it was easy for a yeah. lot of people. And uh, well, obviously there wasn't a whole lot of uh, extra pin voting or anything like that because you would have a higher number, right? <laughs> yeah, we were all wondering what a Russian hacker would have cost to rig the election. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, we talked earlier at a, uh, off before we started recording, and it was about the. Um, the difference of having uh, women on council uh, in these numbers, because um, you were you grew up with sisters, and uh, there's a certain different way of dealing with things, right? Yeah, I, I think there's obviously a different perspective. I mean, you can, and you see, if you look around the world, 
Uh, my understanding is that, for example, uh, that Timmins and Sudbury both elected female mayors. Mm -hmm. uh, there, are, you take a look at the cabinet. Mm -hmm. uh, you take a look at just look at the United States. I mean, who are the the names? Nancy Pelosi, uh, you know, uh, uh, Cheney. Uh, you know, these are the and you know you've got Whitmer. That's the governor of uh, Michigan and. I mean, there are a lot of women in getting involved in politics and doing an excellent job of mm -hmm. it uh, because they do, you know, they, they understand uh, what goes on and they should understand, you know, I mean, they're half the population. Well, yeah. Why should they be outnumbered uh, by men in this day and age? Well, this is an excellent example here, you know. Uh, four new women and a fifth with experience. Tanya, uh, on there is it? That's right. Eh? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. No, it should be uh, a real eye opener for everybody and probably a learning curve and uh, for the, uh, uh, the the older white guys. <laughs> well, I mean, and it's uh, it's great, uh, you know, when you're the father of daughters and granddaughters. Isn't it marvelous to have role models? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for the uh, the young ladies to see that you know politics is no longer a man's game. Yeah. Well, well, there yeah. was two women running for mayor this time, right? Exactly. Uh, now, uh, some are saying that um, Leslie Leslie McVitie's participation may have uh, split the vote enough that Joanne couldn't uh, uh, surpass Peter's uh, vote. What do you think of that? Well, I don't see that she got like huge numbers. I mean, mathematically, technically, under twelve hundred. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, uh, technically, I guess if all of her votes had gone to Joanne, then Joanne would be the mayor, is my understanding. But you know, from what I had uh, heard, there were people who could not support either candidate for mayor for whatever reason. And did they park their vote with Joanne? Or not. And McVitie? Yeah, yeah McVitie. Leslie. Leslie, yeah, sorry. And uh, Who was excellent, by the way. Yeah. She was genuine, very nice. Well, I'm sure she was. You know, yeah. I mean, I've never met her, but... Uh, uh, so, did they park their vote there so that they could vote? Very possibly. Uh, I know of people who told me that they didn't... They really couldn't vote for either mayor's candidate. Mm -hmm. And just like a lot of people told me they weren't voting for school board. Uh, and I mean, look what happened at the school board. That was a surprise, wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, so... Uh, I was disappointed. I wanted Chantel Phillips and Erica Lougheed in there for to uh, teach uh, Jay Aspen a little bit. And now he didn't even get in. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's got to be very disappointing for Jay. Yeah, yeah. Well, he had a long time, long tenure. Yeah. Um, but I think people wanted a, a sea change there, right? Yeah, well, you could see... You know, from the results of the uh, of the election, that people were in the mood for mm -hmm. a change. Well, just judging by the comments under last week's column, I wrote um, Jericho has a lot of female support as well. So the genderization isn't a hundred percent for sure. Well, I'm sure Peter has. I mean, Peter can be is can be very charming, and he's. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's uh, uh, you know he. Let's face it, why wouldn't there be a lot of women that oh, yeah, for sure. like Peter? I mean, he's, he's a likable guy in many ways. Yeah, yeah. No, and he's been, uh, he's done a lot. He's been involved with a lot. Um, so, um, yeah, no, I don't think it was a genderized vote on the, on the mayoral. So it's really hard to sort of figure out, you know, would it have been different? I think it would have been different if Joanne had a stronger campaign in the first half. Uh, I think she that's where she could have she lost some ground there. Yeah. Well, it's always easy to look back, eh? Hey? Oh yeah. yeah, I know. And yeah. try to figure out uh, where you went wrong. I'm interested in her plan B. I heard I, I saw Chantelle her sister say that uh, now for plan B. So I'll see, I guess we'll find out what's going to happen there. Yeah. Well, but but there's. Who knows, maybe her sister has a plan and Joanne doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> maybe Joanne doesn't know yet. Um, she hasn't broken it to her, but anyway, it'll be uh, interesting to uh, 
to follow that up because well we're talking the next municipal election is four years away yep and four years is a long time a lot of stuff changes a lot of stuff I changes. mean you can uh, you know it's not unusual for a member or a couple of members of council for whatever reason uh, to to change yeah you know and um, circumstances and uh, the city's needs and what people think are priorities yeah and I'll tell you the uh, like it looks like we're going into very rough waters uh, and it won't be a time it's like with your own personal finances this isn't the time when you're going to be buying that uh, red convertible sportster that uh, you've always dreamed of running down the road that'll be on the back burner and I think that that's what we'll find at uh, City Hall that uh, all those little red sportster convertible ideas are going to have to be held back the thing that you know just like in our own lives if the roof leaks we'll fix it if the furnace breaks we'll fix it uh, and of course uh, you know you got to feed your family and pay your bills and those are the priorities uh, but uh, as far as the extras go you know the two-month tour of Europe well I guess we'll push we'll that back to, we'll just have to wait and see and I mean uh, uh, really I mean uh, and we all already know that there's an infrastructure deficit we've seen that through the new modeling that they've done there's always been an infrastructure deficit uh, but you have to sort of keep at it a bit so it doesn't get away on you uh, so that things that are in poor condition don't end up being emergency disaster replacements speaking of arenas um, that's the big one that's the big ticket item it's uh, certainly doesn't have uh, clear support as proposed for Omashill as designed um, and but the existing arenas uh, have some uh, you know shelf life that is shrinking quickly if not gone what do you think is going to happen there is that something that can be put off? They might lose that federal grant, but... Well, the federal grant is one of those grants where you need to measure what you gain to worse what it is you might, it might cost you. Yeah. Because it's not without strings attached. Yeah. Uh, it might cost $10 million to get to 25 right? Yeah. Or more. Or more. And, of course, we don't know where things are going to go because of the delays of construction, and we know where it happened with construction materials. So well, those estimates could be out the window. <coughs> uh, the Ice Palace, as I've been happy to call it, it, I've never been really supportive of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, when we talk about the property behind uh, Memorial Gardens is unstable. Mm -hmm. Well, Omichel is no stable place either. I mean, that... Well, they've already had to, uh, they've already had sinking in fields, let alone buildings. So, is it unstable ground? Yes. Uh, is the reason that it's being built like this, to hit the bedrock? Well, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, should we be having a double rink like the regular double rink, where you have common area and, uh, you know, you don't have it in the shape of a V, which is a lot cheaper to build and all the rest of it probably uh, is the property behind Memorial Gardens stable that was a swamp too I mean Northgate was a swamp uh, in fact I think they store water under some of the parking lot there because Chibwa Creek used to meander through all of that so th it's got issues uh, West Ferris well, there's, uh, there's property there to build a rink, but then you don't have the property, uh, even if you'd have to get rid of the ball field and all the rest of it, but there just wouldn't be enough parking uh, to facilitate. Uh, we, we don't have enough land right in that area, unfortunately. Um, well, so where else could we build it? Is it, you know, could we build it over, you know, there was one time they were going to partner with the college and university to build something uh, up there. And of course, up the hill, you know, you don't have swamp. 
so that, you know, the, as far as the ground, the stability is a lot better. Um, could you do it across on what used to be the Nord Fiber John Mansville property, where we all thought the casino or a, a freestanding Walmart mart might go one day? I guess there's a possibility. There. If anybody has a, uh, an idea development in a place that's uh, almost shovel ready, this is the time to come on out, <laughs> really. Well, you, there was a, a suggestion at one time that uh, it'd be built uh, at the North Bay Mall. Yeah, You'll remember I think that, that. Uh, property's gone now. Yeah, well, yeah, the, yeah because uh, it looks like uh, uh, No Frills is expanding into some kind of a superstore. Right. And uh, I guess it's the uh, uh, Heart Department store is taking over part of the area where yeah. whatever. And uh, so the, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, if, and you know, it's really too bad because there was a, a lot of money spent in a, an intensive search looking for property. And then they settled on uh, Omashaw. And uh, are we eventually going to get stuck at Old Michelle? Maybe. Well, we might be snookered at it. Like, you're already a couple million in, just on the engineering and the prep and uh, whatnot, maybe even more now, with uh, trying to uh, get uh, re-engineering for this, to achieve the grant or qualify. Uh, so you're about two and a half or to three, probably in. I don't know. There's Wendy, Wendy, uh, you got to fish or cut bait at some point when you, when you uh, yeah, it depends if uh, like if you can just find a, a suitable location and uh, you know I mean the, the truth is if you have a good solid piece of flat land I mean these double rigs they, they've been built in many places it's not like you have to custom no design it eh? yeah just see what we've got sure. 